I'm John Corstein, uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center and Park in Newport News, Virginia. And I'm going to tell you a cosmic story. You know, everyone talks about the Monitor, but there were other ironclads. In fact, at the conclusion of the program, we realized that the Monitor wasn't the best ironclad to serve along the Atlantic coast, and yet others were. So, war's revolution had hardly been considered otherwise. The stress and strain of total and protracted war works unavoidable changes to men and institutions. The American Civil War is often considered the first modern industrial war. Both North and South endeavored to mobilize all of their resources to wage total war. This experience revolutionized naval warfare, and in doing so, forever changed the American political, social, and economic fabric. Proponents of sea power had witnessed major changes during the 19th century in ordnance, motive power, and ship design. Now, this all happened right before the Civil War. In fact, the man that really recognized it in America was Stephen Russell Mallory, former uh, chairman of the Committee on Conduct of Naval Affairs and the Confederate Secretary of the Navy, he realized that a new class of vessels, hitherto unknown in naval service, was needed. Mallory knew that the possession of an armored ship as a matter of first necessity. Well, very, very true. That initial answer was actually found in the ashes of Gosport Navy Yard, Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, on 20 April 1861. And basically, they saw, found the Confederates amongst the ashes of the yard, a way to start building an ironclad Navy. The partially burned steam screw frigate USS Merrimack was raised, placed into an undamaged dry dock, and uh, they started to convert it to an ironclad. And I got to tell you, news of this Confederate ironclad went everywhere. Southern newspapers, uh, you know, said with joy, oh, we have enough materials at Gosport Navy Yard to build a fleet of ironclads. Oh my gosh, by summer of 1861, guess what? Everyone in the North is hearing about this. And the Union Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, already knew that the U.S. Navy was uh, actually outdated and um, he had to have an effective shipbuilding program to stop the all-important Confederate cotton for cannon trade. Accordingly, Wells realized that the Union had to construct armor-clad vessels capable of countering any ironclad the South might produce or purchase and to ensure the closure of those Southern ports. Now, um, I have to say that uh, Wells contacts Congress and says, oh, look, you know, um, much attention has been given to the last few years to the subject of floating batteries or steamers. And Congress was asked to give $1.5 million for the construction of armored ships. And they set up an ironclad board consisting of Flag Officer Joseph Smith, Flag Officer Hiram Paulding, and Captain Charles Henry Davis. They started to submit bids uh, or requested bids on August 7, 1861. And once they, they surveyed, surveyed the 16 designs that originally showed up, uh, you know, one was made of rubber. They said, oh, the shells can bounce off. Well, as we know, shells explode, rubber sinks. So two designs were rapidly agreed upon. One was what was going to be known as the Corvette Galena. While the Galena was approved, Davis question, Charles Henry Davis question, uh, is that ship stable? Uh, and the guy who was building it or was the factor behind building it, Cornelius Bushnell, uh, who had made a fortune in shipping and uh, railroads, went to meet, let's see, John Erickson now, went to meet uh, the, uh, uh, of course, this man, John Erickson, who said, yeah, 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 your ship is stable. It'll do this, it will do that. But then he pulls out of his closet a cardboard model of what will be known as Erickson's battery or the monitor. Bushnell goes, wow. And um, he actually arranges for uh, the USS monitor to receive, or the Erickson to receive a contract to build the monitor. See the plans of the monitor right now? This is a unique design. The uh, turret is what makes it so 
special. You know, it's shot proof design. It could be quickly built. And uh, while the monitor was the first ironclad commission and that enabled that ship to fight on 9 March, 1862 uh, and stop the CSS Virginia, Merrimack as some would call it, from the destruction of the rest of the wooden federal fleet in Hampton Roads. Erickson's ship became the toast of the nation, known as the little ship that saved the nation. Now, right away, because of the success of the Monitor, Erickson received several more contracts, 10 right away, to build Monitor type of vessels. And um, so the Navy even um, converted the steam screw frigate Roanoke sister ship to the Merrimack into a three turreted monster. Uh, that one didn't work very well. Now, so the problem with the monitor, of course, is what? Lack of firepower, um, lack of, they're not very seaworthy, as we know, and poor ventilation, limited speed. And despite these problems, they made more monitors. They made actually 64 monitors or laid down during the Civil War versus 84 other types of ironclad. The first of the three ironclads approved by the ironclad board um, was basically known as the Galena. Now, this is kind of a setup deal because actually Cornelius Busnell knew Gideon Wells. He knew this person, he knew that person. And so uh, he was ready to do everything he could to preserve the nation, but at a profit if he could. So uh, he already um, had organized the construction of the Undella class gunboat Oswego uh, to be built at Charles Mallory and Sun Shipyard of Mystic, Connecticut. And uh, while he's doing that, he actually hires the designer of the Undella class gunboats, Samuel Hart Pook, whose father was Samuel Moore Pook. I think we have a picture of him. Uh, that's Samuel Hart Pook. Uh, and uh, basically, he designs the Undella class. There's his father. Of course, Samuel Morse Poop, who actually designs what are known as the city class ironclads or Pook's turtles. Well, this is uh, pretty uh, special. However, you know, by there's Corleus just now. Now, I got to tell you, see, in June, Bushnell already knew that he was going to get a contract to build the Galena. So he hires Samuel Hart Pook and so that he can get the designs, everything. Um, and so he uh, actually interacted with William Seward and Gideon Wells. And he had an early warning from the Navy Department uh, to go ahead and construct these ships. Now, I got to tell you, Samuel Hart Pook, right, was um, noted for building clipper ships. In fact, he built the Herald of the Morning, he built the Witchcraft, the Northern Light, and the Red Jacket, amongst others. In fact, the Red Jacket was the holder of the speed record for New York City to Liverpool run, as well as the Liverpool to Melbourne routes. Well, I got to tell you that uh, you may make great clipper ships, but an ironclad is a different story. Um, so basically, um, you know, the Undela class is just like the rebuilding of the USS Pocahontas and Gosport Navy Yard by Samuel Moore Pook. Of course, his son knows everything, you know, that his dad is doing and learns from him. So I have to tell you uh, what's going to happen is that the proposed ironclad, the Galena, um, they receive funding, notice of funding, right, uh, in you ready? June of 1861. So, um, you know, basically it was designed as a wooden hull steamer uh, or schooner rigged Corvette um, with three masts. The initial armor plan was really bad. It had a, a composite armor of 2.5 inch wrought iron plates backed by 1.5 inches of Indian rubber and supported by an 18 inches thick backing of yellow pine, heaven help us. Um, so uh, that's not very shot proof as we're gonna learn. Now, um, actually Joseph Smith makes some changes with uh, 
uh, heart pook. And so uh, the ship was lengthened. The armor scheme was slightly changed. They got rid of the rubber backing. They added a cover of iron boilerplate. And so uh, this is not very, uh, well, as we're going to learn, it's not going to be very protective. And the Galena characteristics Basically, it was 210 feet in length. It could go eight knots. It used Ericsson engine. It had 200 pounder Parrot guns and one 30 pounder Parrot rifle and four nine inch Dahlgren shell guns. It took 150 men to operate this ship. However, the more traditional design is going to be selected by the Ironclad Board, and that is the USS. Irons, new iron sides, please. And this barkentine rigged warship was constructed based on the lessons learned from the Crimean War. Basically, they stole the plans, the glory, and it became the first, which became the first ocean-going ironclad warship. And so uh, that is is going to be named in so this is a case mated ironclad well protected with uh, 4.5 inches of armor and it got its nickname uh, because one of the first original six frigates uh, right uh built for the navy uh the constitution earned the nickname Const old ironsides when the frigate defeated he didn't capture the HMRA on 19 August 1812. The British vessel was badly shot up and this man, however, many of the British cannonballs appeared to bounce off of the Constitution's 21 inch thick pine and Southern line oak. This prompted an American sailor to exclaim, huzzah, her sides are made of iron. So, that's where we get the new iron sides from. Now, American Sons of Philadelphia are going to build the ship. Uh, they actually have to use William Camp and Sons. And basically, uh, this the new iron sides, I have to tell you, to kind of stop it from having too deep of a draft, they have to actually have a rather wide beam and a flat bottom. And they had a two-piece articulated rudder, which did not work well because of the hull design. And so, so the ship uh, was coppered and, and you know, it, it used only sails going down from Philadelphia to Hampton Roads and they got removed right away. So problems everywhere, you know, uh, during the initial construction of the new Ironsides, they needed to spend more money, $34,000 actually, to put on gun ports or gun shutters, as we like to call them. Uh, we also knew that um, we had to, uh, um, the, the funnel, as you look at this picture, you see the funnel, but behind the funnel is the pilot house. So that obstructed the view. So actually when it's in Hampton Roads, uh, or actually Port Royal Sound, where it will eventually go, it will cut down the funnel, but then the smoke from the funnel asphyxiated everyone in the pilot house, so that didn't work well. This ship has 12 11-inch Dahlgren guns and 250-pounder Parrots. It was far more powerful warship than any other ship built in the United States during the Civil War. And so, Basically, this ship uh, has um, you know powerful armor, for, as I said, 4.5 inches, um, which is the armor belt. Uh, it dropped to 3.5 inches below the waterline. Um, all the side armor was backed. I have to tell you, uh, and, and the plating was all you know monitor we laminated the plates well let me tell you we didn't do any laminated these are 4.5 inch solid plates which makes it far better this is a huge ship 232 feet in length um it has uh an engine uh a two-cylinder horizontal engine uh made by merrick uh, it can only make six knots so that was one of the bad things about it so on to Hampton Roads. The new Ironsides was commissioned on 21 August under the command of Commodore Thomas Turner. And 
<clears throat> and so um, it arrived in Hampton Roads. Can I have Thomas Turner, please? And um, uh, they had some repairs there. This guy was a real teetotaler. He got Thomas Holdrup Stevens fired as commander of the Monitor because he was a stemptious. However, Stevens was not. He fell down drunk in front of him. Boom, he lost his job. So anyway, uh, now, while all this is going on, the Confederate or the Federals have already been building an ironclad. And it's known as the Stevens Battery. The Stevens Battery was actually had an appropriation in 1842 by this Robert L. Stevens and Edwin Stevens of Hoboken, New Jersey. They built their own shipyard. They got 250,000 from Congress. And uh, it was an amazing concept. And that's what it really was, a concept. So this is the first, um, uh, how could you say, you wanna go past these uh, new iron sites, please. Um, you, uh, the first government sponsored, there it is, eventually. Uh, this is the first sponsorship in any nation of an ironclad, 17 years before the commissioning of the Glory. Well, you know, the ship uh, has all sorts of problems. It was supposed to have 4.5 inches of iron. And then all of a sudden, everyone said, oh, my gosh, we got rifle cannon. We've got shell guns. And so the Stevens said, oh, wait a second now. We're going to make it even better. And so in 1854, they almost, well, this project almost got scrapped. Then what they'll do is expand the ship. It has armor protection of 6.7 inches of iron. It has eight steam engines operating the ship. It was capable of making 20 knots. Now over almost $8 million has been spent by 1865 and the ship is still in dry dock. So John Stevens says, oh, I'm gonna fix you guys. And so he buys a ship called the Nagatuck. And uh, the Nagatuck, uh, uh, well, that he went and put his concepts in it, it's semi-submersible. So they had Alice tanks that could lower the ship in the water, uh, unfortunately. Um, it had some other little quirks to it. Uh, you notice the uh, uh, rifled parrot gun uh, near the bow. That would be loaded from down in the vessel in the casemate by a mechanical loading device. Oh my gosh, this was very advanced. In fact, a little too advanced. So when the Stevens fix up the Nagatuck and they actually call it the E.A. Stevens battery, guess what? The Navy says, we don't want it. And so United States Revenue Cutter Service uh, are going to uh, actually commission it and then loan it to the Navy. Well, I have to tell you, um, you know, the Virginia, next slide, please. Um, the Virginia, uh, of course, is down there in Norfolk. Uh, and so that you got the Naugatuck, the Monitor, and the Galena there in the harbor, facing one ironclad, but Louis Machis Bros. Goldsboro, suffering, uh, commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, is suffering a dreaded disease right now known as ram fever so he's afraid to bring everything into battle so consequently um they're going to have a uh, uh, abraham lincoln is going to come down to slide please come down to hampton roads and they are going to uh, they're going to plan the capture of norfolk now actually the virginia came out on april 11 1862 and the Naugatuck was there. Now, the Monitor stays behind uh, Fort Wool, but the Naugatuck sends several shells towards the Virginia, CSS Virginia. They miss, but anyway, that is kind of a close. I think the Virginia would have sunk the Naugatuck, have given a chance um, without much doubt. So it would have sunk the Galena. Because the Galena gets down into Hampton Roads uh, by the 29th. You know, actually, it's supposed to be called the Retribution by uh, Bushnell. But I got to tell you, uh, Grant now is a great hero. And so what happens? They name the ship for Galena means iron. And Grant was born in Galena, Illinois, so voila, that's where we got it. Now, Lincoln, of course, says, you know, we got to capture Norfolk. That's the lair of the Virginia. 
So actually on um, May 8th, 1862, Goldsboro, uh, thanks to the leadership of John Rogers talking to Abraham Lincoln, will plan a naval assault. This is such a powerful naval assault because it sends, right, the uh, Naugatuck, the, and everyone calls it Stevens Battery, they call it the Naugatuck, you know, what can I say? Um, and supported by the Susquehanna, San Jacinto, Dakota, and they begin shelling the Confederate positions at Sewell's Point. Voila, the Virginia comes out and they retreat. Oh my gosh. But see, the trouble is, Tattnall has to make a decision because while those ships are moving against um, um, Sewell's Point, guess what? Into the James River goes the Galena, Port Royal, and the Roostock, and they will uh, defeat um, the two main batteries protecting the lower James, Fort Boykin and Fort Hushi. You can go to both of them today if you wish uh, to see where shells from the Galena and the Monitor hit. Well, anyway, so as soon as those lower batteries are done, the Galena goes up the river, gets all the way to Jamestown. There is no Confederates there. In fact, they've abandoned everything all the way up to what's known as Drury's Bluff. And you can see Drury's Bluff on this map. It's May 15, Fort Darling, and what it was called. Everyone calls it Drury's Bluff. And so basically what's happening is that the ships will come up the river. And to make a long story short, uh, the Galena uh, puts itself in position on the morning of May 15, 1862, forward position, because Rogers knows his ship is a punk ship. But he says, we have to prove it. We will be damned if we don't prove our valor. So what's going to happen is uh, the Galena takes the lead, and the Battle of Drury's Bluff does not go well for the Confederate of uh, the Federals. You got obstructions, and so they got to defeat the fort first. And basically, what will happen is the Galena um, will actually be uh, struck. Uh, well, thirteen shot hold the and you can see stab in this picture. I mean. The Galena um, was in terrible shape. Now, what happens? The monitor tries to come up. They can't elevate its guns, so it's not effective. It gets struck two times, three times, excuse me, and falls back down the river. The Naugatuck on its 17th shot, the gun blows up uh, because of the casemate design beneath the gun. No one is injured, but I have to tell you, um, it is looks like everything's going bad. You know, the Galena will finally, now if they start the action at 7.30, by 11.30, the Galena has to back off, they say, from a shortage of ammunition. But in truth, it's because her deck is not properly protected against plunging shot. Neither is this tumble home design that you see right here. It's kind of like clapboard. Trouble is, shot hits. And the clapboard hits against the other one behind it, and it's worthless. And so basically, you know, the uh, actually William Keeler goes on board. The Galena says that the ship looked like a slaughterhouse of human beings. The decks were covered with large parts of half congealed blood and strewn with portions of skull, fragments of shells, arms, legs, hands, pieces of flesh, iron, splinters of wood and broken weapons were mixed in one confused horrible mess. Think about that when you have your lunch. Anyway, so lessons learned at Drury's Bluff are number one, the monitor may be shot proof, but it lacked effective fire control, firepower, and uh, so there are serious problems with the turret design because of that. And the UN U.S. Navy, oh my gosh, they tell the uh, you know, cutter service, you can have the Naugatuck back uh, or EA Stevens back. And so that drops out of, a, and the Galena, slide please, uh, they will take the armor off the Galena, right? And they will use it as a wooden sloop uh, during the Battle 
of Mobile Bay, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, I have to say, whew, this is tremendous. Now down to Port Royal Sound, we have to take our attention because there is where Rear Admiral Samuel Francis Dupont is planning this much desired ironclad attack on Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie, Charleston Harbor. And, you know, everyone, I have to tell you, like Gustavus Vassa Fox, Assistant uh, uh, Secretary for the Navy, he is like, uh, you know, he's fixated on capturing Charleston, the nest of the vipers, the home of secession. Ooh. And so he believes, as as well, that the ironclad monitors could do almost anything they wanted to do. Now, John Worden has already proved that the monitor lacks the, the power of its guns and slow rate of fire to really defeat a fixed earthen fortification. So this is a problem, um, but DuPont is pressured. And so the new Ironsides comes down to Port Royal Sound, becomes the flagship of Samuel Francis. Isn't a beautiful ship? Now they take those masts off, I have to tell you. And they actually have one mast that is a conning tower uh, where actually DuPont will be during the battle. So, you know, anyway, um, uh, so I have to tell you, uh, um, ironclads are showing up down at Port Royal Sound. Uh, they're mostly Passaic class monitors like the Weehawken, Passaic, Montauk, Patapsico, Nahant, Catskill, and um, uh, the uh, um, Nantucket, and so, uh, and then also you have your broadside ironclad, the new ironsides, and then you have another crazy ironclad, um, which was designed by Charles Whitney, former partner to John Erickson, known as the Kia Cook. Notice it's called Whitney Battery. Well, I got to tell you, this is one of the first ships to be constructed completely of iron. Originally named Moduna, uh, the Kia Cook was named for a city in Iowa, believe it or not. I don't know why. It was built by J.S. Underhill Shipbuilders at Greenpoint, Brooklyn, New York, and was launched on 6 December 1862. Besides total iron construction, this uh, only used woods for the deck planks and filler in its armor. The hull was featured in an experimental armor scheme sandwich of one inch iron plates enclosing a two inch inner layer of wood bolted together and placed within a wooden framework. This wood and iron was then covered by a half inch of boilerplate. And those look like turrets. Well, they're not. They're called towers. They're conical. And everyone thinks, oh, double turreted monitor. Well, it's not. Uh, it has a ram bow. And uh, so these um, uh, towers are made of another composite made from one inch by four inch deep horizontal iron bars alternating with yellow pine planks of the same dimension. Then sheathed with layers of overlapping flush bolted one inch rolled iron plates. Y'all already know that does not make it shockproof. Um, so the armor almost sounds good, 5.7 uh, five inches. It was not because of this composite is not going to work. Now, the bow and stern sections of the ship could be flooded to lower the vessel into the battle. Ugh, gosh, this is, sounds great. This ship is only 159 feet, 0.6 feet long, beam at 36 feet, two screws, uh, four cylinder direct acting condensing engines with three boilers. Hey, it could make nine knots. It only had two 11 inch Dahlgrens because they were on a pivot mount on a wooden carriage in a very a revolving wooden base, right? And so they could fire forward, stern, uh, and then broadside. So they thought this was really good. 92 men were on it, unfortunately for them. Alexander Ryan is going to be the commander. Um, and uh, so there he is right there. Now, so 
The long-awaited assault on, on Charleston is going to come on 7 April, and they come in in a line ahead column, right? And so they got to get, now you can see Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie in this map. Now they get parallel there where there are obstructions and torpedoes. The ship that led everybody into Charleston Harbor was the Hawken commanded by John Rogers. He stops because he sees barrels. He thinks there's torpedoes. The whole line falls into disarray. The Passaic class monitors do not prove very good. Actually, Lee Hawken was hit 43 times and a torpedo lifted it out of the water but didn't damage it. Um, I have to tell you, Wee Hawken takes on water with a shot through its deck, so it has to break off action. Um, the other ships come, I, I gotta tell you, USS Passaic, right, was struck 35 times. One of its 11 inch, its 11 inch Dahlgren gun is going to be damaged, disabled, and the turret malfunctioned. The Tapsico took 47 hits. The Catskill took 20 shots, which broke the deck plates and forward deck planking. This caused the Catskill to take on water. I got to tell you, word in, in the Montauk, you know, it's a swift current, flood tide, and so they're having trouble keeping those monitors. Remember, they only go seven knots, so they're a big problem. Um, and uh, so, in essence, you know, they are having problems staying in position, and they get as close as 500 yards to Fort Sumter. The Nantucket got struck 51 times. Its turrets were jammed. The Nahant, oh my gosh, 36 times it was struck. The pilot house was struck. Flying bolts killed the helmsman and injured the pilot. This is not good. These all back out of action. Now, what do our other two ironclad board ironclads do during this battle? New Ironsides is a flagship, right? But this channel is not is, is very shallow, swift water, and also, um, you know, the ironclad could run aground. They have to actually anchor several times during the battle. Actually, the New Ironsides only got off one broadside during the entire battle, and one time it anchored over a three thousand pound torpedo. And guess what? It didn't explode. Uh, that's another story. But it was struck by 50 shots, no damage whatsoever by those 50 shots, and uh, they had no casualties. So now we have to get to the real failed ironclad, the Kia Cook. And I have to tell you that it moved up. <laughs> yeah, there you can see it right there. Not happy about facing Fort Sumter cause. It moves near the end of the engagement. It moves up ahead of the Nahant and uh, 600 yards from Fort Sumter. The Confederates focused their fire on the ironclad. Oh my gosh, it was struck 90 times. Uh, it was under armored, under um, weak armament, and it was holed between its waterline almost by 20 projectiles. It was in a sinking condition when it moved away from the battle and actually it would sink the next day. The pilot on that boat happens to be the famous uh, African-American pilot, Robert Smalls. Well, you know, DuPont's attack on Charleston was a failure. The SAIC monitors proved to not be up for, see, they anchored them. And so that became a huge problem. And so they were fixed just like the fixed fortifications, they were fixed. And so the Confederates had little markers out and they could really, uh, they fired 439 shots at these ironclads. And so, uh, and those 40, uh, 439 shots struck these monitors and new iron sides and the Kia Cook turrets were jammed. Pilot houses were a nice target to shoot at. And, DuPont says, well, look, these ironclads, if we try to attack again, we probably lose some ships. Actually, the Confederates um, recovered the Lebanon's Dahlgrens from the Keokuk. And so this is a huge trouble. So we're proving right now that, yeah, the Federals could build a lot of ironclads on the Atlantic coast, but could they properly blockade a port? Could they properly? Uh, 
close and capture a port? The answer is no. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, so the Federal Zerkers, they got lots of iron, they got a lot of energy. So William H. Webb Shipyard will build this massive ship known as the Dunderberg, which is lightning, a thunder mountain, thundering mountain in Swedish. Uh, it's designed by John Lentall, who actually designed the original screw frigate, the USS Merrimack. Uh, <clears throat> and it was equipped with sails. It had everything you want. It was 397 feet in length. Can you believe that? It was the largest, longest wooden hulled vessel produced in the United States. Well, I have to tell you, this ship had a double bottom collision bulk works. Um, it was designed to mount 15, four 15-inch Dahlgrens and eight 11-inch Dahlgrens. Wow, look at that ship. Well, <clears throat> the problem is that it's not finished till the war's over. U.S. Navy says, well, we don't need that anymore. So William Webb has to find a buyer, right? And so basically, um, they, uh, during the build up to the Franco Prussian War, Otto von Bismarck wanted to buy uh, the Dunderberg, Dunderberg. And so when Louis Napoleon of France found out, he said, oh no, we're going to buy. He outbids Prussia. And so this becomes the um, French ironclad warship, the Rochambeau. And uh, so, the Rochambeau, uh, I mean, the French acquire it in 1869. Within a few years, they'll scrap it because uh, it was just too big. Its ram, believe it or not, was 50 feet in length. So this is based on the Virginia design of casemates with a ram. So these all are bringing the concept of the Merrimack into fruition. Well, there's one more so-called ironclad that is going to be made, and that is known as the Sputin Devil, uh, Duvel. <laughs> and there it is, also known as the Strong Bully. I have to tell you, it's going to be built by the William W.W. W. Um, wood Shipyard in Fairhaven, Connecticut. Uh, it was wooden um, with a low freeboard and then plated with five inches of armor on the sides, three inches on the deck, and five inches in its pilot house. You can see the pilot house right in the middle. Well, it had a retractable spar torpedo. However, it only made five knots. And if you think about a torpedo boat that could only make five knots, what do we have as a problem? We have serious problems. So this um, actually fought at the Battle of Trenches Reach on 24 January 1865. However, it did really nothing and was used as an experimental vessel until uh, it was scrapped in 1880. This thing was only 84.2 feet in length, uh, draft of 7.5 feet, um, and it only had this bar torpedo. Following the failed ironclad attack on Charleston, new Ironsides remained with the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, continuing to bombard Confederate defenses uh, on Morris Island, Fort Wagner. Uh, they actually participated in a failed boat attack to capture Fort Sumter, the crew members. Uh, they actually were attacked twice by torpedo boats, but on 5 October 1863, the CSS David uh, blew a hole in her hull and inflicted minor damage, however, and caused one man to die of his wounds. So that was not very uh, good. This ship will then go up to Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Navy Yard will get repaired. Then it's assigned to the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, where it will fight during both the first and second Battle of Fort Fisher, and it plays a critical role there because of its seaworthiness, because of its armor, because of its gunpowder, that it is able to range a shot. Remember, we got this conning tower so they can range their shots into each one of the uh, Confederate um, gun positions 
that were protected by traverses. But uh, this ship played a huge role. And actually, some of her crew members uh, will, um, believe it or not, participate in the, uh, you know, yeah. David Dixon Porter, then commander of the North Atlantic Block Blockading Squadron, goes, you know, we don't want the Army to win. We want the Navy to win this affair. So he organizes an attack of Marines and Blue Jackets. The Blue Jackets were armed with revolvers and cutlass, and Porter tells them, we'll take it by boarding. Well, they don't. And uh, so, but uh, the new Iron Side, so let's talk about this. Ever since the Battle of 8-9 March 1862, that set off monitor fever in the north. Of the 84 ironclads built for the Union, now not all those went into the water. Some were built of green wood and were scrapped. Some were really bad, like the Casco class, which I'll talk about some other day. Um, but, you know, uh, 64 were turreted monitor. Nevertheless, the most durable ironclad serving on the Atlantic coast was indeed the USS New Ironsides. While slow, she only made seven knots versus the warrior, HMS Warrior, that made 18 knots. The New Ironsides was far superior to any monitor design in its seaworthiness, armor, and armament. The heavy broadside power and superior solid iron plate made it into an ironclad, the only ironclad in the United States Navy that could truly stand up to European styled ironclads. Monitors, of course, you know, in the post war era, uh, how many monitors are sold to foreign countries? Well, you know, I think it's three. And uh, so the monitor was recognized as not being unsuccessful because of its unseaworthiness, lack of firepower. This ship, however, merged all these design concepts that the British and the French were developing into a far superior vessel. Its only problem was its uh, draft of 15.8 uh, feet, uh, which uh, limited its movement in some southern harbors, particularly at Charleston, which limited its role in the battle. So, as um, one sailor said, Huzzah, her sides are made of honor. And that's my review of coastal Atlantic ironclads other than monitors. Any questions? Hey, John. Um, I I'll actually respond here. I'm not sure. Oh, there you go. Julie is on. I'll back away. Yay. I'm <laughs> um, hoping that I'm there. I see your name anyway, Julie. Yes, there so you are. There we are. Um, Beautiful art in the background, by the way. At my house or yours? <laughs> yours. Thank you. Yours as well. Um, I hope you all noticed how many slides today were from the Mariners Museum collection. It, it's amazing. Our repository of fine art as well as archival materials and models and today's topic really did show some of our highlights especially with the pook family um, we do have questions john let me get to them okay michael asked how did new iron sides compare in armor and firepower to france's ironclad the Galois? Well, the Gua uh, was very equal to um, the monitor, I mean, the new Ironsides. Actually, I think the new Ironside, because it's 150 pounder rifles uh, that it had on board, uh, it was probably stronger than the uh, uh, Gloire. And uh, so uh, I would say if they were in a head to head battle, um, I would give the odds to the new Ironsides. It had more armor on it than did the uh, French ironclad. However, if you put the new Ironsides up against the warrior, the warrior had all these rifled cannons. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, uh, it went 18 knots. So if it couldn't blow up the new Ironsides, it just run away. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so, but yes, it was the best ironclad made in the United States during the Civil War. 
floor and asked, did the US Navy ever do any actual testing of the armor plate capability at Washington Navy Yard? You would think they would. Yes. <laughs> Yes, they did. Um, they actually did tests before the Civil War at Gosport Navy Yard and at Fort Monroe. And one observer said, well, that iron's not really that good to block shot. Well, they're, you know, uh, they're not laminating iron. They're not making it thick enough. So, um, but yes, yeah, thanks to Dahlgren, Dahlgren's always experimenting with better guns, guns to solve any problem that he saw before. So he was a very advanced thinker. So yes, they did test it. Um, you know, why some of these designs were approved, I think it's the rush of getting ironclads out, particularly, I'm gonna do a program soon about the city class ironclads. And all I can say is uh, they're not shot proof, but they were ironclads. And that's what made it different. It was the production of so many ironclads. Just remember, the Confederates only put 23 ironclads in the water. It shows you uh, who's going to win that war. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, numbers. Doug asked, what was the minimum effective armor? Um, I think um, what happens is that you have the development of the 15-inch dog run with at fairly close range within 500 yards, they could break the back of a Confederate casemate that would generally have 22 inches of oak and pine backing and two layers of two inch iron plate. They broke the back uh, or the casemate of the Atlanta. They broke the casemate of the um, uh, Tennessee, which had six inches. However, the iron plate would be stronger if you made it as one. So, uh, you know, I would say you need to really start plating your ships with six inches or more. And it becomes, you know, you have to start doing new styles of steel production to really catch up with the ordnance development that happens in the latter part of the 20th century. We have a comment here, which I'm getting back to from Peter. Um, let me get down to the bottom here. Well, Kevin comments that Brant's home in Galena is a worthwhile visit. Beautiful and interesting town. I've not been there, so thank you for that, Kevin. Um, been there. <laughs> David tells us that Chief Keokuk of the Salk tribe that therefore Keokuk, Iowa's name, which which you mentioned, John, somewhat. Um, so I'm getting down to Peter's. Keokuk's guns are on display in Charleston. Just one of them. Um, it's in uh, White Point Garden. The other one was exploded by the retreating Confederates. However, there is the one, it's got a marker on it. There's several other guns in uh, uh, that park that is right there is what's called the battery uh, where they used to hang pirates. And of course they had a small battery there. Uh, the Confederates to get two 11 inch Dahlgren guns right under the nose of the Federals was like a great huzzah because uh, you know they had trouble producing enough heavy sea coast um, ordnance. Peter says, what comments have sailors provided about the noise, especially from combat with the operation of these ironclads? Huh? Huh? I uh, huh? <laughs> uh, look, they did not do well. Uh, you know, you're supposed to, when you're firing your gun, as with a field gun or whatever, you're supposed to cup your hand over your ear, open your mouth, and lean this away. Ah. Uh, well, that, you know, is not that good of protection. I'll tell you, know, my dad uh, was a veteran of three wars and, you know, he uh, um, he couldn't hear very well. <laughs> but uh, the big thing is um, that, no, they had no protection for their ears. If you look at, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a book called The Monitor Boys about the crew of the Monitor. And there's numerous ones saying, I lost my hearing, I need a pension. 
And uh, so that's a constant fabric. So you have to be, you have to realize you're in, just this picture being in the iron turret of the monitor and a solid shot strikes it. It will have like a ringing of the bell effect. You go up in a belfry and you um, uh, have the bells ringing while you're up there. Not a smart thing. That's why the rope's down at the bottom of the church tower. So yeah, it, um, they had no protection and uh, numerous will complain that they lost their hearing as a result of the war. I can imagine. Well, John, you want you want to tell them why why you were home today because of the vice president. Mess yes, mess you know it's really really crazy because uh, I live maybe uh, thirteen miles away from the Mariners Museum. I live in, of course, uh, um, seventeen fifty seven Georgian Manor House uh, here on Sunset Creek in Hampton, Virginia, and so. You know, every morning when I have to give a lecture, I go to the Mariners Museum because we have a little projection area that works really nicely. And I uh, hopped in my car quarter till 11. I had my special route and then boom, it was blocked. I said, oh, how dare they? And so then I looped around to try to go on another because it's best for me to go interstate to get to the Mariners Museum. So I tried to get to another one. Boom, it's blocked. Then I tried to get over to Julie's house because she has better computers than I do. And I couldn't get over there because it was blocked. So I'm trapped, I tell you, trapped here in my house. I guess they made sure I was quarantined today. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but um, the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, is going to be at Hampton University today. I believe also at the Newport News. Uh, yep. um, yeah, poor Quasimodo, I saw that, Mark. Uh, yeah, uh, I just have to say that, uh, um, you know, uh, there have to be so much security these days. And so our audio was a bit challenged today, so we apologize for that. But John had worked hard, and so had I, on this program. So we, we wanted to forge ahead, and it will be posted to YouTube um, in about a week. And I imagine Sherry told you that John's next lecture is September 24th, virtually, the Battle of Newmarket Heights, which is going to be fabulous. And we look forward to your joining us again and come see us at the museum if you're nearby. And thank you, yes. John, as always. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, for your help and Leon. And have a great weekend, all. We'll see you next time.